whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so welcome everyone. Hi, I'm Amber Blakely. I'm from the University of West Florida. Um, welcome to the 2020 NPSMA annual conference of course being held virtually. I'm just glad everyone can make it. Um, so just so you can kind of see where we're at in this virtual conference, uh, we had a talk yesterday, today. Um, obviously, we're, we're here to hear about the resources and products for laboratory simulations. Um, and then next Friday, be sure to tune back in. We'll have student project presentations, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Okay, so just a few ways that you can keep current in the PSM world. Uh, be sure to look out for announcements that are coming into your email. Of course, this is uh, those of you that are members, uh, you'll have PSM news and then next. Um, you'll also have some opportunities to feature your PSM alumni and graduates. Um, also share best practices within your programs. And um, of course, again, highlight your students and alumni. We just had one that, was, that came out recently and you'll have the opportunity to submit any uh, nominations uh, for the next issue. And of course, there's ways to get involved. Um, you can volunteer your time, just contact anybody here on the board. Um, and I'm, we have this slide here just to kind of give you a reminder of the membership benefits that we offer. Um, these will be scrolling through, so I won't spend too much time going through that. And of course, we're on social media, so if you're on any of these, I hope you'll find us and uh, join in the conversation. And also, this we are planning to host this conference next year in Tampa, and we hope to see you in 2021. All right, so I'm going to hand it off to Jack uh, to introduce our speakers today. Okay, thanks, Amber. Um, all right, so today we've got, we're gonna have three different presentations uh, representing different companies. Um, and then we'll have an open panel question and answer uh, after that. So um, we're gonna have uh, Camillo Echeverry from uh, Labster. So that's, it's an interesting company uh, that does actual laboratory simulations, both virtual reality or just online allows students to go in and actually make decisions and have different outcomes. Um, the second speaker will be from Jove, the Journal of Visualized Exper Experiments. Um, we'll hear from Allison Callahan. And that's, uh, many of you may already be uh, familiar with Jove for um, looking at visualized or video versions of uh, manuscripts, sort of. But there's also a lot of good educational uh, material in there as well. And then, um, We'll hear from Johnny Trong from uh, Benchling. Uh, they have software that uh, allows e-notebooks and um, additional software that associated with that, but also there's some educational components that can help you integrate e-notebooks. So the reason that I put these three together is these are, because of the time of COVID-19, we're very remote and it's very difficult to give students um, a good, you know, real life experience. So these are some alternatives that my university ha is employing in order to uh, give the students a better experience, but also after we evaluate these, maybe in the long term, it'll allow experiences for those students, even when we're back face to face and allow maybe for more online content. So I'm sure many of the PSM programs might want to have part or all of their uh, content available to students online. So uh, with that said, we'll start with, um, with Camillo from Labster, and he'll give us uh, about a 10 minute presentation. Thanks, Camillo. Perfect, all right, let me share my screen really quick. Can everybody see that? It should just say Labster Reinventing Science Education. We can see it. Perfect, well, just to give you guys a little introduction to myself, um, I actually work with schools all over Florida, and basically my role is working with professors, administrators, and just showing them ways to incorporate lab simulations into their curriculum, whether it's to increase student outcomes in face-to-face -face courses or online courses. So let me get started right over here. Um, so just to give you guys 
kind of a little general background on us. We actually began as an outreach project at the University of Copenhagen back in 2013. So our co-founder, he was actually a PhD student in charge of labs. And this is what actually led him to developing Labster back then. But since 2013, um, as you guys have seen, we've grown extremely quick. We have about 170 different simulations covering a variety of different courses in biology, chemistry, physics, engineering. And actually since the start of this year, we've been able to support over 3 million students basically stay on track in all their courses. And just to give you guys a general background, kind of, we, as we continue to grow, we realize that there's many different ways that students will be able to benefit from lab simulations. So nearly any real world scenario can be simulated. So whether you guys are looking for lab safety, you know, how students should handle lab accidents in their actual courses, um, or things like mastering techniques, learning protocols, or even seeing things they can't see in the real world, they're able to do in our virtual environment, such as building molecules. But overall, simulations are basically a way to give students the ability to retry and experiment in a safe, cost-effective environment on your students' terms. And, you know, just from speaking to professors, administrators all over the country, these are the ways that we see simulations improve outcomes the most. Um, to begin, you know, we're able to decrease the knowledge gap between your high-performing students and your struggling students. Um, as an online resource, we're available anytime, anywhere, no matter where your students are doing it or what time they're doing it at. And, you know, with a gamified approach to help your students learn and conceptual topics and skill mastery go alongside of that. Now I wanted to show you guys a little bit of really what our platform looks like. Um, this is gonna be a bunch of different simulations to biology, chemistry, physics, and I will just speak in the back of that. So currently our platform has about 175 different simulations and we add about five to 10 every single semester. But each of these is supposed to be a, be a gamified case study covering one to two lectures in one lab practical session. And for your typical student, these are gonna take them just about 45 minutes to an hour to complete these. Each simulation is actually built around the storyline that's gonna link the abstract theory and the techniques covered to the real world application. So as a student in any of your courses, they're actually gonna be required to complete every step that they would complete in a real web lab. In doing so, your students are actually learning the lab protocol. They're still putting on their lab code. They're still putting on their goggles. They're still putting on their gloves. So they're understanding that before they're even going to you guys. And instead of just being a simple digitized version of a real lab, the platform allows your students to learn in a way that's typically not possible. We incorporate interactive cellular and molecular visualizations, multiple choice questions throughout these simulations that are graded, and your students can actually change the variables and make mistakes. They could blow up the lab, they can mix the wrong chemicals, they could not wear the proper attire to their lab, and they're able to understand from that. And finally, each simulation is graded and a platform is integrated into your LMS. So whether you guys have Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, D2L, um, all of this is gonna be automatically graded. There's no need to manually transfer any grades and they're also all trackable. You can see how long your students have done it, which questions are getting wrong the most. So you are getting some metrics based off that. And these are really just different ways that we're deployed in courses typically. Um, really just sticking to your immediate needs, which kind of what we've been used for a lot right now. You know, the online lab course has been a huge thing that we've been able to work with um, in the time with everything going online. So let's really just stick to that for now. But we have been working with Arizona State University in a partnership with Google, and we actually developed the first fully online, um, fully accredited biology degree. So their students, are getting a four-year degree, getting into vet school, getting into different programs using our virtual lab simulations. And I think the key things here is they were able to keep high student engagement and interest using this platform instead of, you know, resources they were using in the past to try to develop this. And they were greatly able to lower their cost with scalable access to virtual labs. And they've actually been ranked the top for innovation and award-winning online undergraduate degree for biology. So, that's just one way that we've been working with a school in a really large um, scale to, for basically all their students in an online environment. Um, and what I really wanna emphasize here is when you combine traditional teaching and Labster together, this is where we see the biggest outcomes. Um, 
this was actually published in Nature's Biotechnology, and it shows a 101% increase when we're actually able to combine forces with instructors, professors, coordinators, in lieu with Labster. And another example of how we've been able to help benefit students, instructors, even before this whole pandemic happened, um, you know, with California State University, this is basically an example of how the outcomes we were able to achieve with them. Um, they had a failing rate in their general biology course of almost 20%. After they were able to use Labster, that went down all the way down to 5%. So 95% of their students, thousands of students every single semester were able to pass because they had a resource like Labster available to them. So really in closing guys, you know, Labster is gonna benefit your students in a variety of ways. You know, they're realistic simulations. They have real life problems to solve. There's immersive animations, interactive quizzes, and your students have the ability to make mistakes. Science isn't always about just doing something and doing it right, you know, it's about making mistakes, understanding how to do it in the future. And that's really something that students and instructors really love. And that's really all I had in store for you guys today. I know we only had a little bit of time to present a little bit of, of who we are over at Labster, but really happy I got the opportunity to show you guys who we are, what we do, and how we can improve courses. And let me stop sharing my screen here. All right, and I will pass it back to Jack. All right, I think I'm up next, actually. Great. All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Give me one second. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Callahan from Jove. I'm a curriculum specialist on the customer success team here at Jove. So my role is to assist faculty in anything they might need. Uh, prior to working at Jove, I did preclinical ocular research where I actually used one of the Jove videos to learn how to do eye dissections. Uh, so I definitely have an appreciation for how Jove can be used to help researchers in the lab. But today we're going to go through how do you guys check if you guys have access to Jove? What are the products? And lastly, what support is available? So just to begin, what is Jove? Jove is the world leading producer and provider of science videos with the mission to improve scientific research and education. Millions of scientists, educators, and students at thousands of universities, colleges, hospitals, and biopharmaceutical companies worldwide use Jove for the research, teaching, and learning. And we're actually the brainchild of a scientist who, like many of us at some time or, or another, he was having difficulty learning a new technique. Uh, while Moshe Prisker was working on his PhD at Princeton, uh, he was trying to culture neural stem cells in serum-free media, and he tried to first do it from the protocol and he couldn't get it to work. And ultimately, he ended up having to contact the author of the paper uh, traveled to Scotland and spent $10,000 between travel costs, uh, reagents, housing, so on and so forth in order to learn the technique. And so he said, there has to be a better way. And so he came up with this idea of having a video journal. So we started as a research resource. Uh, we now currently have more than 12,000 uh, journal articles. So we're also peer reviewed. And as I said earlier, we're a methods based video journal. Uh, now we've evolved to also have education resources as well. So no matter where students are in their career or academic career, we're gonna have something that's useful for them. Um, but just to start off, how do you guys check if you have access? The way Jove works is that libraries subscribe to Jove. So rather than uh, professors and students paying for the subscription, libraries do. And so many of you actually probably already have Jove subscriptions and already have access to these resources. So just to start off, how do, how do I access the content? Uh, on campus, you get access just by being within the IP range and just being on the Wi-Fi. You can get access on your cell phone, tablet, uh, computer. Then off campus, you can get access just by uh, making a Jove account with your university email address or using VPN. To check if your school actually has a Jove subscription, you're gonna wanna go uh, make a Jove account. Making a Jove account is free, and then you can go to the jove.com slash access page, and then anything that you subscribe to will be highlighted, and you can see the access that you have. So just to start off, a lot of you probably already have access to this. Now let's dig into what the different products are and how they're useful. So to start off, 
as I said earlier, we're a science video journal. Uh, we initially started with these met methods based articles. So it's kind of similar to those lovely little cooking videos that you have where you have a chef who's this most amazing chef expert in the field. He's making the best cake you've ever seen. And he's got these, um, the video of him doing and making this amazing cake. Then he's got step-by-step -step directions and how to do that. And then lastly, there's a list of materials that you would actually need to make this cake. So we applied that kind of idea, but to science. So if you wanna do agarose gel electrophoresis, or you wanna do aseptic laboratory techniques, these are, these are just some of our most popular articles, uh, but you can see the different journal sections that we have, but we go to the experts in the field and we videotape them doing the experiment in their lab so people can replicate it. And our videographers are specifically trained to make sure nobody's hands are in the way, or if they're working in a hood, their, their face isn't blocking the hood so you can actually see how the technique is done and this is how I learned how to do eye dissections. Uh, so now we're going to dig into uh, some of our education resources real quick. Uh, so the first education resource we're going to dig into is our science education library. So what this is, it, it takes our journal articles a step further. So where our journal really focuses on the technique, our, our science education library actually combines like the whole concept behind the technique, as well as real world applications. So you can see the different sections that we have. We have everything from biology, chemistry, nursing, uh, engineering, and environmental science, physics, and psychology. The way these videos are set up, they average about nine minutes long. Uh, we have closed captioning in more than 10 different languages. So if you have international students, they're going to be able to watch the videos in English, see the closed captioning in their native language. But just as an example, the way the videos are set up, so say, say you're feeling crazy, you say, I want to do some microbiology, let me create a Winograd C column. The way the video is going to be set up is a cute little animation explaining what is a Winograd C column. Then we're gonna show you with real lab equipment what that process looks like. And then we're gonna go show you the real world applications. So you get a really a full picture of what the technique is. And again, as I said earlier, we've got the closed captioning. They average about nine minutes long. And we also have question banks for all of our education videos as well. So that's something that you can use if you wanna test your students and see if they understand the material. Now, the next product that we're gonna get into is our lab manual. Um, so we currently have two of them, an introductory biology lab manual and an introductory chemistry lab manual. The introductory chemistry lab manual includes uh, content related to both chemistry and organic chemistry. Uh, and the way each of these lab manuals is set up is for each lab, uh, we have three videos. We have an instructor prep video, we have a concepts video, and lastly, we have a student protocol video. The instructor prep video, it's not just, it's, it's not just, a, I guess to say that with each of these labs, this isn't just a resource for students, this is a resource for instructors as well. So uh, with the instructor prep section, there's a list of learning objectives. So if you're preparing your syllabus, you can just copy and paste those over. Uh, there's also, again, a video that's gonna show you how to prepare. And there's gonna be written directions on how you should prepare for the lab, as well as a list of materials for 10 students. So you can multiply it out for however many students that you have. Uh, then we have a cute little concept video that explains the concept behind the experiment. Uh, and lastly, we have a student protocol that has both a data collection component and a data analysis component. Because nobody's just collecting data for the sake of collecting data. They're collecting data to actually uh, do something with it. Um, so yes, just with these lab manuals, it kind of gives the students a full perspective of the lab and also with these labs, eventually they'll end up being in person. But for now, students can watch the instructor prep video to see kind of what would go behind preparing for that lab. And lastly, we're gonna go through our last resource, more of a lecture-based resource, I should say, uh, CORE, which is our video textbooks. We currently have three of them and we're soon adding more. Uh, we have a CORE Biology, a CORE Social Psychology, and lastly, a CORE uh, Social Psychology. And we're gonna be coming out with a CORE Molecular Biology, and I know they've also got a CORE Physics in the work as, Works as well. These are more intended for those lecture-based courses because these are more kind of related to those fundamental scientific concepts. So here you'll actually see our core social psychology. You can see the different chapters. Uh, within each of the chapters, we have several about two minute long animated videos. 
Um, in addition to that, they also have a scientist in action section. So you can see kind of the real world applications of uh, those scientific concepts. And that scientist in action section pulls from that research resource we looked at originally, our video journal. And so I wanted to highlight core social psychology because even for schools that do not subscribe to Jove, core social psychology is open until the end of the year, uh, as well as core chemistry. Those are our two newest products that we've come out with. So even if you don't subscribe to Jove, say, you know, come Thanksgiving, your campus, uh, your, 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 your school's on campus now, but maybe everybody's going home after Thanksgiving. This is a resource that you'd be able to use until the end of the year. Um, but again, one thing that I really like about the core social psychology is because it has this nice little statistics section. And I know this can be a nice review for students going into the lab. And now that we've kind of gone through the resources, kind of how would you use these? What support is available? Let's dig into that. So we have two teams of scientists that are here to help you out. Uh, we have two dedicated teams that are here to support our subscribers. We have the customer success team, uh, which I am a member of. Um, and we, everyone on the customer success team has some scientific background. As I said earlier, um, I have done preclinical ocular research. I also have a bachelor of science in biology. Um, others on the team, we have professors on our team, we have researchers on our team, and what we're here to do is provide you with one-on-one -on -one support and help you uh, help to pull resources that are tailored to your course, as well as help you to embed the videos into your LMS, whether it be Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, etc. Um, we can also help libraries with things like outreach materials and creating embed guides that are specific to your school. The other team that we have is our subject matter expert team. That is a team of PhDs who actually make video playlists tailored to your syllabi or to whatever your lab training is. So let me show you a little bit more about that. Uh, so what we will do is that the process takes about a week and a half, but our, our team will actually put together a list of materials that's specific to your course and we pull from the subscription that your library has. Uh, so this is just one way that we like to support our subscribers, kind of give you a short list of relevant content and tailor it to your lab needs, or your class needs. And lastly, I just wanna highlight on our website for those who again are subscribers, a nice area for you to look at is our faculty resource center. Here we have some pre-mapped syllabi so you can check that out and see syllabi that have already been mapped. Uh, we also have a section of integration guides so we have both written and video tutorials on how to embed our videos into various LMSs and lastly we just have some guides for using our content in Zoom uh, so on and so forth. Um, but thank you guys. If you have any questions, I'm sure we're answering questions at the, get, at the end, but you can always reach out to the customer success at jove.com email address. And I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> All right, thank you. And uh, last speaker will be Johnny. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, All right. Get set up. Hopefully everyone can see that. Everybody else. Okay. Um, let me just. Yes, me. I can see it. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, um, so hey everyone. Uh, my name is Johnny Trung. Uh, I'm the academic evangelist here at Benchling. Um, really grateful for Jack and the NPS, uh, NPSMA for inviting uh, Benchling here to come give you guys all a talk. Um, and so I think for us, um, I would love to kind of talk to you all about today about how Benchling is actually a very practical teaching platform for a variety of science courses. And some of you may, may be already familiar, but some of you may not and be wondering, well, what is Benchling in general? Um, well, Benchling is a cloud-based data management platform. Um, you can customize, scientists everywhere use it, um, and you can customize it in a variety of ways, but the most popular ways people use it is one as an electronic lab notebook, an ELN, or uh, two as a molecular des biology design uh, design suite, um, basically to analyze, annotate DNA or proteins, um, and then essentially to number three for scientific collaboration. Um, we are a completely free resource for academics uh, and for anyone who's using it for educational purposes as well. All you really need to get started is any valid email address and just a laptop or a computer. Um, you know, also uh, by the end of today, I hope you also would be familiar with these two images. Um, our company logo is actually a jellyfish for those of you um, who um, may not have known that. Um, it actually has a really cute uh, you know, origin story as it's actually inspired from the discovery of the green fluorescent protein, uh, GFP, which is actually isolated from a bioluminescent jellyfish. Um, 
a little bit more about the company in general. Um, in, in addition to valuing, you know, cute and fun characters, we also have an, a lot of other values. Uh, at the core, our mission is really to fundamentally change the way research is done. We want scientists to focus on their science and not worry about the busy work around them. Uh, right now, we actually have over 300 plus in employees who feel, feel very similar, um, half of which actually also work directly with Benchling users like myself and have backgrounds in uh, the science, uh, in science, biology, chemistry, and so forth. Uh, additionally, the vast majority of our users are academics overall. We have over 250,000 academic scientists who have signed up for a Benchling account to support their research. Um, and finally, we also support areas of industry. Um, we have over 300 plus customers in biotech and um, national uh, pharmaceutical companies. You know, and just a small preview, these are just some of the logos and organizations that we work with across industry and academia that have used or purchased Benchling. Now, uh, I want to also talk a little bit more and explain about how Benchling is also shifting our focus um, to the educational community. Um, we know that a lot of universities and schools have really been forced to shift their classrooms uh, for remote, uh, to be remote, and also many institutions are learning how to adopt distance or hybrid learning you know, models. Now, independently, we've even started receiving requests from our users about, you know, is there content that um, we already have that could be used in an educational setting? And, you know, we steal a huge potential for Benchling to really assist educators and their students within this virtual transition and in more of a long term effect as well. And you may think, why do we think that? Well, first of all, um, we'd like to think that Benchling, while it's primarily used for research purposes in academia and industry, the students who are, your students who are actually getting exposed to Benchling now and earlier are actually gaining very practical experience in science. More and more, we're seeing biotech companies value the knowledge of science-specific software, especially electronic lab notebooks. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great one day basically to have your students put Benchling or some other scientific software out of their ELNs and so forth as a skill on their resume, just like Microsoft Office or Adobe or so forth. Um, you know, that's really what we want to achieve with this initiative with Benchling for Education. We want to standardize the way students learn about science and how they conduct science. Um, so, you know, overall, um, for the rest of the talk, I just want to show you a little bit more about what our product actually looks like. We don't have time to actually for me to give you a demo, but I'm um, happy to talk about that afterwards if you, some of you are interested. Um, then I also talk about some of the educator resources we are developing and are, are currently in development. And then additionally, just want to show you a few real life stories of some actual educators using Benchling in their classrooms. So, um, for, for the first module I, I talked to you about is that we have uh, the Benchling notebook. This is really just a top of the line ELN that can be used by educators and students in just a number of ways. Um, I have a few kind of features highlighted out here, but you can actually, um, you know, it is a cloud-based platform and you can, you can actually track, um, you know, students activity by each, by their particular account and their contributions on uh, the notebook. So students can, collab can collaborate right in a notebook and they can also see, you know, what each student wrote and, uh, and back and forth. Um, number two, you can actually evaluate uh, students' uh, work and responses on Benchling and actually leave comments in the Benchling platform itself by looking at their entries, or you can actually ask them to export it um, um, uh, and as a PDF and then have you uh, submit it to any other particular uh, um, grading platform or for any other, uh, yeah, or for any other purpose. And then additionally, one thing we really love about Benchling is that you can actually compile these particular notebooks for to, to be exported. Um, so students who are working um, for a semester long project can actually get a electronic file for all the work that they've done and save that with them as opposed to, you know, carrying around a paper notebook or, or so forth uh, for the rest of their, their time. Now, um, the, the second other big component of Benchling is our microbiology design suite. This is obviously very helpful for a lot of you teaching courses in biology or related to these particular concepts. Um, you can help students uh, design a number of features um, within biology, um, and you can also utilize a lot of real-world biology concepts. Many of you may have personal research that you'd, be, you'd love for your students to uh, understand better or incorporate into your courses, and Benchling Microbiology Suite can, can do that for you. Um, you can additionally, depending on how co uh, complex your course is, you can integrate really simple concepts from PCR, primer design, to really state-of-the-art techniques that we support, like CRISPR or codon optimization and so forth. Um, so this particular suite or component of our product is, is very, very advanced, but you can also simplify it as you um, would, would need in a course. 
Uh, and then additionally, similar because uh, of, of its collaborative platform, you can actually leave uh, you know, real-time comments for students about their thought process and design while they're working on sequences of DNA or protein and so forth. Um, and I also want to mention, we won't have time uh, to show you uh, individually about each one, but uh, there's a number of uh, educator specific resources that Benchling has been working to develop. Um, and uh, what my team has been definitely uh, focusing on a lot is uh, how Benchling can be implemented really in a virtual course, um, a fully virtual course even at some times, uh, or even how educators can really just get started as, you know, there's tons of, you know, different software tools or resources you could be using, but, um, and so how to make that transition easier for you and to give you a preview of what that would look like. Um, so first of all, um, there is one resource where we actually have a virtual lab course guide that eventually uh, as a company we developed where we are talking to educators about different ways you could implement, uh, uh, it's a more expanded uh, review of all of the benefits students and teachers would get from using this online platform. Um, I, um, you can kind of check out this ebook later. I'll send um, you know, Jack some of these slides with these preferable links and resources. Um, additionally, we also have a kind of what we call a training kit for educators. You know, Benchling is a software program that can actually be a little bit difficult for people to navigate through. And so we actually have very in-depth uh, product tutorial videos where you can understand like from the user interface of this screen, you know, where do you need to go to add a student, to create a project, to create a notebook entry. So we're developing very um, in-depth product materials for educator specific questions. And then uh, the, our last resource is understanding how um, specific learning modules um, that are relevant to educators. So if you're teaching a specific science class or specifically more biology, how would you teach a student about primer design and PCR on benchling? Or how would you teach them about um, um, you know, restriction enzymes and cloning? So there, some of these are obviously biased to more microbiology, which, which we support more, but things like an ELN and learning how to upkeep that is something very relevant to, to any science. Um, and then lastly, I just want to go over a really quick example of some educators um, and specifically how they are using it right now in their course. Uh, one I want to introduce right now is uh, Harwin King, who's at the University of Maryland, um, who's teaching basically a recombinant DNA laboratory. Um, you know, he's been using benchling for quite a while and he, he's decided to implement it kind of uh, before, uh, you know, this you know, pre-pandemic times and also during. Uh, but what he had to actually say is, um, you know, for the first time, I invited 35 students to keep an LN, ELN in Benchling. This was the best choice he's made, you know, this semester. Normally, I dread hand, handwritten image-stapled notebooks. However, this semester, every notebook seemed professional, clear, and inviting. Um, really quickly before, I just want to show you kind of this, uh, this small gif of what the actual, what uh, Benchling's platform looks like. and. Um, kind of a preview from uh, Dr. Harlan's class, where he has students basically input their own work, separate them by particular lab files, and even separate them by name and, and date. And just, just to give you an example of how professional and inviting they all look now. Um, now, lastly, I'd just like to add that um, I think this is a very new uh, initiative for Benchling, and we're always open to collaborating more and understanding what educators really want and what's the direction that our content should be going. Um, so please, you know, feel free after today or any time to reach out if you'd like to discuss how Benchling can be incorporated into your organization or also how, um, you know, if for any feedback you might have about it. So um, thanks for that. And I'll, um, I'll answer any questions later. So. Sure. All right. All right. Thank you all. Um, so I'd say we can open up for any questions from uh, the audience, the virtual audience. <clears throat> this is Judy Brown. Sorry, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, oh, I suppose we should raise hands like we're in class, right, Gerald? Right. So first I want to say thank you um, to our presenters. I do use um, your products for two of you. I won't tell you which two, but, um, and my question is um, with respect to membership or subscriptions. So Benchling I know is free for academics and I hope that will remain along through COVID. But your other two programs, um, are there subscriptions available that are reasonable costs for small programs to purchase? Our university library does not support Jove. 
our university does not support Labster. Um, and at $100 per student or so for Labster, it's become, it will become cost prohibitive, I think. So I'm wondering, you know, as you're growing and expanding, you know, we understand companies need to make money. They're great products, but are there other mechanisms that we can help with that would lower costs for us to have access? Uh, yeah, specifically in regards to Labster, um, the hundred dollars a student is the highest rate any any instructor will ever pay. Um, so what a lot of schools that I work with have done um, is basically what's called a site wide license. Basically, what we're doing is giving this out to everybody, um, and that price ranges from one to ten dollars a student, just depending on the size of the program or things in that sense. Um, so ninety nine dollars is the highest rate, um, and it's basically just for really just depends the needs you need, but on a larger scale, one to $10 um, is typically where one of our clients are gonna pay for the site-wide license. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm, I work with the account managers, but I don't handle the library subscriptions. That being said, since we are a small publisher, we do have a lot of freedom to, with pricing. In addition to that, we also do regularly have uh, open access resources every month. So for example, about 20% of our journal articles are open access articles. Uh, prior to working at Jove, that ocular research video I was discussing, I, at that point in time, I was working at a contract research organization. For those of you who are familiar with those, they don't pay money for anything. And so they, they didn't subscribe to Job. And so I was just like stumbling around the internet being like, please, I need to learn how to do eye dissections. They're paying me to do this on a study. And so I, I found a video that was open access. So one, we were a small publisher. We do have uh, flexibility with pricing. Two, we do have uh, free access and open access articles. People do publish uh, open access articles with us. Um, and I, I am somebody who discovered Jove through one of those articles. In addition to that, within our science education library, as I mentioned, um, with things like core social psychology, core chemistry, our new products, when they come out, they typically try to keep them open for at least six months so that people can use them if they'd like. Um, in addition to that, within things like the lab manuals, there are also open labs. And if you go to our lab manuals, you can see a little unlocked lock. Um, and as far as our standard science education videos, the first education resource we came out with, um, when you go through those, again, we always have one that's open every month. So we, we have options. Just a quick question about benchling. Um, do we have I see that we have free access. Um, is there a certain amount of gigs that we get free? And do we have to pay for that if we exceed that? Um, yeah, so there is a storage space limit of, of 10 gigabytes on Benchling. And we've never actually seen any users actually accumulate that. Um, okay. And those, those are, those, that space is actually only if you attach files into Benchling. So you can upload a lot of different files like data sets, you know, um, actual um, data from um, Excel files and so forth. Um, and so if you are actually downloading or uploading those large amounts of data that exceed that limit, um, then um, you can actually just request to have more space. We never had an issue with people um, getting to that space limit, but that's, um, but yeah, but there is, uh, there is one set in place. Okay. And then if I link, um, uh, like I'm the administrator to my students, I will have direct access to all of my students' data that they input. Okay. I see a shaking of a head. Yes. Okay. And that will just, I mean, we, semester after semester, we just add more students, but we'll be able to keep all of that content that we accumulated over the course. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The way, um, the way Benchling works is, is a little bit complex because a lot of academic research labs actually collaborate on it already. Um, but as a teacher, we have some recommendations about how you should set up like permissions and these particular settings for an instructor. So you have administrative access over all of your students' data. Of course, they'll be able to keep it for their own, but you will always have access to view it, to grade it, whatever. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just make a comment that um, Temple University, uh, the biotechnology program has used Labster and um, this semester we're, we're using Labster and we're on week 11, I think, right now. Um, but we only purchased, I guess, the license. Um, you would know what we're talking about. Uh, uh, I think for about seven modules or 
because that's all we needed. There were some modules in which um, we were including a field trip where they were allowing us to visit in spite of COVID. Um, and then, so, so we didn't need to have 14 modules as such. So I think we're gonna continue with that license and add a couple more modules for the second part of uh, the spring semester. And um, it has been, um, yeah, it, it has actually allowed us to continue with our program. Uh, so it's, it's been a big benefit, just as an FYI to anyone else who's considering using it. We paid $70 per student and it was cheaper than buying lab reagents, frankly. Um, our cost this semester was cheaper than all the past semesters because of all the equipment we need to, all, all the supplies we need to purchase. And now, only time will tell us if it was equivalent to mm. having actual lab work. Um, many of our students already come from labs, you know, so this is, if they're doing CRISPR-Cas9, uh, they're learning uh, concepts. Um, the techniques they may already have down. For those who don't have techniques, obviously this is, COVID is just going to be a hindrance. Yeah, that's, that's also a really good point to say. Um, like I said, you know, our pricing is very dynamic depending on what instructors need. You know, obviously if you need seven modules, seven simulations, or you need 20 or 30 per course, um, we know we have the flexibility to work on kind of making your needs. We don't want pricing to be a barrier. Um, so we really just work with however we can get this kind of integrated with you guys, depending on your outcomes and how many simulations you need and things in that sense. So that's all, that's a really good point. Thanks for that, um, Simo. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll second that. Sorry for the earlier interruption, Judy, and my apologies. Normally I'd have my camera on, but it decided not to work this afternoon. So sorry, not hiding. But uh, to echo SEMA, we've done the same thing. We, we, we've, we use Labster, we use Jove. Uh, sorry, Benchling, not yet, but, um, but now we'll take a look. Um, uh, thank you for presenting. And the same issues, I echo Judy, it's scalability, and we've tended to institute Labster um, in two modes. One, very focused for a very specific purpose, a few modules uh, when needed, but otherwise it's been for large scale courses, which did bring the price down considerably. And for us to echo Seema's point, um, now is emergency mode, but in the long run, uh, the difference between say our, our program majors for whom hands-on and future application is really part of what we think their learning mode should be and the trade-off between simulation as good as it is, as wonderful as the animation's on, it's still not you know, hand-eye coordination and muscle memory. So um, that's part of the trade-off, but it's been very helpful for us. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be using it in, in targeted ways in, in the future. So thanks for your presentations. And somebody asked about free versus paid, part of our experience too, um, you know, how big is the group in integration? We use Labster for undergraduates and big courses. It integrates with Canvas. So it's not just reagents, there's different levels of cost saving and labor saving going on. So I think it really depends case by case. So Gerald, can you comment on that real quickly then? Because that's where my question is, is the integration and, and maybe you can, um, what, Camilo, you can talk to that for me. Does your company do that aspect? Because that aspect is me. That aspect is me linking out and finding the virtual training and going to the Jove websites and um, yep. providing the links to the Benchling training and pulling all of that into my, my programs and courses, um, yeah. Blackboard site. Uh, that's, all a that's a really good question. Um, we basically take care of all the heavy lifting. Um, in terms of the integration, we work with a lot of LMS administrators and it takes them about five minutes to get it set up in your course. All we have to do is send out the consumer key and the secret and the secret key. Once you put that in, basically this could be spread out to any instructor like a flip of a switch. Right. Um, so in a site-wide license specifically, you would do that. I can't imagine it would take an extra five minutes. And once that is done, every instructor, all they have to do is pick the simulations they want. So if they want one simulation or 100 simulations, it takes the same amount of time. Um, it's extremely easy and we, we do integrate with most learning management systems, 
but we definitely don't want technology to become a hassle and that's make everybody's life easier. So right. that's really what we're trying to do in our kids. Um, take a lot of the hard work from you guys. We do the training. We do the, we do basically everything from getting the simulations to getting them, to getting your students simulation. So we take care of all that. And we also hop on calls with LMS administrators to walk them through it. So it's a very, very seamless, quick process for everyone involved. Excellent. I'm wondering maybe too, if we might as PSM talk about PSM memberships for some of these at some point. I know some of us are at larger universities like me, but they're just not supportive, especially obviously we're all having budget crises, but um, mm -hmm. in the future, because we've looked into this and the university said no. So, yeah. um, In terms of that, one of the biggest things that has come out of this is site, um, institution, system-wide, um, whole, uh, essentially, in, for, the, for example, the community college system of California, about 115 different colleges oh. in there, they couldn't individually do it. But we went basically from a top-down perspective and the institution itself paid for everything. Oh. So it had no student fees. It had um, no fees for the actual uh, community colleges specifically. Um, we've done that with the university system of Florida with the ones that did have the ability to, to, to use it. So a lot of them went that route. We've done it with a ton of different systems. And that is the most effective way in terms of it's extremely affordable when you go from a top-down perspective okay. instead of going first to it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have a question for uh, about Benchling and the uh, online uh, online lab notebook. Mm -hmm. um, when you collect data for different research and you publish with the data, or I, mean, I don't know, write a grant, get a grant, or uh, get a patent, or this kind of thing. How legal is that document online? Is that something that will be recognized by other institutions as a classic lab notebook, or will that be a problem? Uh, yeah. That we got? So you're, you're mostly talking about kind of like the IP of a lot of the research that you would be doing on Benchling. Is that correct? Like, um, who owns that? Um, I mean, obviously, we, we like to think of ourselves as a tool. It's kind of like, we, we definitely, we, Benchling does not claim that we own any of your IP. Um, for your institution, uh, it, it actually, we actually defer to your institution on its own rules. Um, technically, your Benchling account is to the particular user, but if you're using Benchling to do university funded research, most likely you need to report that to your university or there needs to be um, um, some kind of record that, that this is where your information is known, especially if it's university funded. Um, other grants, like wherever you're, what research is being funded from, it, it can probably have a little bit more leeway about who necessarily owns that research, um, maybe that granting institution or so forth. Um, but yeah, eventually doesn't lay claim to any of IP and usually it will be between your lab um, or your PI, um, or if you're the PI and, and uh, the, the institution as a whole. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess this, this is for Johnny and following up, I guess, in Lionel's uh, point mm -hmm. there, but do you have experience? I know that we're talking about education, but do you have experience, uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, with some of your companies that you listed? Do you have experience with the support uh, when going for patent applications or defending uh, intellectual property lawsuits or whatever? Yeah. Um, I mean, I will, I can definitely say that, uh, I actually have a friend who does this too. Um, if you, let's say you're in patent law and you're looking at certain novel gene sequences, a lot of the ways some people share them is actually sending a benchling link. So some people like might be filing for a patent or NDA, they might actually just send you a link of, to view the sequence in benchling. And one of my friends who is like a patent lawyer just uses benchling to view it. it I mean, technically it's just a tool. Um, that is just a very specific use case for the particular tool, um, but I, it has been used that way. We, again, like Benchling doesn't claim any IP about what information is stored and distributed on Benchling. Um, you know, that is between you and the, the, the researcher, so, Good. yeah. Just to make sure, again, about Benchling, sorry, um, but just to make sure that for publication purposes also, that this this documentation is, you know, where it needs to be for publication purposes. 
Yeah, no, uh, completely. Uh, you know, a really cool thing too is that a lot of uh, new journals are actually, um, or a lot of authors are actually just publishing a link to like a, a Benchling share file or a Benchling, you can actually hyperlink out to a Benchling sequence or, or, or a particular protocol or whatever. And I think a lot more people are putting that in SIs or materials and methods just because it's more easily available as opposed to saying like, this is the vector, you know, whatever, so, so, you know, you can actually send people a plasma map and they can actually annotate and look at these genes or um, uh, parts themselves. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm still very new with this system with mentioning, but can we export everything so we don't lose all the data from the students and then we cannot grade and we cannot use that for a course? Yeah, uh, you can definitely export um, student, every, every individual student, you can export them as an individual project and, and that exports each of their, their projects as a, an entire PDF. Um, Sequences don't export. You can only export those in like a FASTA file or a, you know, a universally accepted uh, gene file. Um, so you can only, uh, but like for notebook entries, if you're using the ELM component, that can all be exported as a PDF and it'll maintain hyperlinks and other, other things um, that have been attached. Perfect, thank you. I have a question for Allison from Jove. I checked our institution, we have a, do have a license for Jove Research or Journal, but I noticed not for the education module. So if I'm working with students looking as you were for particular techniques, how rich a resource would the journal be as opposed to the education modules? So it's gonna depend upon which journal sections you have. So I know if, I know many schools have the biology journal section, which is our oldest. Right section and so what, what what's your area of expertise actually it, it would be biological sciences so. so so that's our oldest journal section so just to kind of put it in context before all of our education stuff existed we just had our journal so there are resources that are within our journal that now would be kind of more classified as an education resource so if you're teaching something like if you're teaching like an introductory biology lab for example we have videos on like you know, how to do aseptic technique, how to do PCR, how to do Western blots, uh, how to do uh, restriction enzyme digest, how to uh, passage cells. So like, there's some of our older videos, so they're not, um, they're, the quality of the videos isn't as good as the new ones that come out today. That being said, some of them are still gonna be applicable. And it's, I, I really like when schools have that biology journal section because it's kind of full of a treasure trove of like, this was all that Job was before. So right. everything kind of got funneled into there. So if, if you'd like, um, feel free to um, just email the customer success at job.com email. And if you'd like, we can actually do a syllabus map for you and find content that would be relevant to your course and go through the journal section and find that so you wouldn't have to. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and I'd say Allison uh, course map to course for me, and that made it a lot easier to to then link those all of those into um, into Canvas. So the students don't actually go right to the Job site; they go into Canvas, and then they have a lot of options. And the way I've got it set up is they're optional because we have a lot of students that have different levels of maturity in these uh, different techniques. And so some, you know, might not want to watch it, right? They may already know it. Others, they have no idea, but it's been a, a, a good thing to Im include this year. I think at the end of the semester, we'll get feedback from the students. Um, as I'm, I'm using all three of these and we'll get feedback from the students on how, how much they like it. I think um, in general, the thing that I'm ha probably having the most trouble with students is not, not really trouble, but benchling being kind of complicated and already a, something for the researchers, it's a little more difficult to uh, figure out how to get a class that's separated from all the other stuff that I've got in there in benchling. So, uh, and it seems like there are a lot of ways for them to share content. And so I could probably use a tutorial on how better to get the students to all sign up and share the same way so that it would be a little more seamless. It's still better than, it was way better, I should say, than doing paper notebooks. I've been grading paper notebooks. This is a lot better than that. I agree, Jack, it's way better. But my problem is I don't want them to share content, so. <laughs> yeah, and sharing the right content, I guess. Exactly. Right? Only the part that you want. Um, but I mean, that may be a more of a user learning. And I think for me, 
the bandwidth of taking on all these new tools this year and getting them into Canvas makes it more difficult for me to spend time on getting through all of the details of one of those. I have a question about Labster. You mentioned that you can blow up a lab in Labster, but is there a capability to go back and sort of troubleshoot why you blew the lab up? Does it have that ability? Yeah, so that's the whole point of really when they make the mistakes, they go back, they understand what they did wrong, um, and they have to redo that section again until they do it right. Um, obviously, not every single part of the lab, they can blow stuff up. This There's very specific things that they should be learning in your lab not to do. And those things are really what's exemplified into this lab. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the biggest thing. Um, understanding why this blew up, how to fix it, and how to, like, in the future, not mix those chemicals, or why you shouldn't wear sandals going to a lab. Things in that case, um, yeah, everything is interactive. And it's meant to teach them why not instead of just showing that they blew up a lab. Out of curiosity, what happens if you wear sandals in the lab in the simulation? So nothing actually crazy happens, but they're they're prompted to essentially um, check what they're wearing. And this is a very a very preliminary lab safety one. You know, we have a bunch of different ones for this for students that are just starting these courses, just to understand these techniques. But um, there's a tire one, and they just have to go out of the lab, change up everything, put on their lab coats, do everything they would do. Um, just to kind of get that understanding of when they're a lot of these students are intro general students first time in the lab They need to understand these type of things. So it's not something that it's in every single lab, but um, definitely those intro labs for that um, it, It's kind of just showing a fun way of really learning that tire you're supposed to wear the proper protocols and things in that sense Thank you <laughs> <laughs> Under age, How long does it take to do a simulation on a labsters? Uh, really depends on the simulation. I would say on average, just going through 175 of them, um, there's a probably about a 45 minute average to them. Um, depending on the student, you know, some of them can finish it in 35, 40. Um, some of them might take a little bit up to an hour. I know a lot of these organic chemistry ones are pretty tough for me. Um, so those definitely have taken me upwards to an hour to finish. But on average, for your typical student, these are probably taking just about 45 minutes to complete. If everything goes Right. So if they blew the lab up and they have to restart the model, do that. Uh, no, not really. If everything was right, this is an average through all the data we have from students. Millions of students doing this. So students that are getting it wrong, that are doing it. Um, if they do something wrong, they don't have to do the whole lab again. They just have to do that section again, just to understand that. Um, so yeah, that's that's in that's inclusive with all the students um, doing things wrong, doing things right, things in that sense. So see, just about forty-five minutes, but it averages differently. Just depending on the student specifically. Thank you. So I'm really enjoying the discussion here and it's great to hear from all the directors and, and others on this call that are using these products. That's really uh, helped explain to me like how it's being used. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, we're at the end of the hour. I don't wanna, you know, keep you guys from the discussion or, or more questions or whatever. Uh, but for those of you that need to to step out. Um, I just want to put in a quick plug next week. We do have the student presentations. Uh, they're going to be presenting on their capstone projects. Uh, so we'll meet here, same link, same time, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And I hope to see you guys come out. So that was it. <laughs>
Yeah, that definitely. Lionel and I work together, so I think you'd probably be doing it with both of us, so. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.